congregation may be seated. Friends, we are gathered as the Church of Jesus Christ today to celebrate and praise God for the union of John and Kate and the bounds of Christian marriage. The bond and union of marriage were ordained by God who created us both male and female for each other. The Apostle Paul announced that where Christ is present, there is surely equality as well as unity. And with his presence and power, one of the very first acts of ministry after Jesus' own baptism was to turn water into the wine. Just don't tell my Baptist friends that that took place. But <laughs> he attended the marriage, and while he was at the marriage ceremony, I have no doubt Jesus danced with the bride. Because one day, he'll dance with his bride called the church. And he'll be with her all throughout eternity. You see, this is what marriage is about. And so, today, Christ calls you in union with him and with one another. And I ask you now, in the presence of God in this congregation, John and Kate, to declare your vows of intent. Because we're not sexist, we'll start with you, Kate. <laughs> Will you have John to be your husband, to live together in holy marriage? Will you love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness mm -hmm. and in health? And forsaking all others, be faithful to him, as long as you both shall live. I will. John, will you have Kate to be your wife, to live together in holy marriage? Will you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health? And forsaking all others, be faithful to her, as long as you both shall live. I will. The marriage of John and Kate unites two families and creates a new one. They ask for your blessing. You see, we don't gather together as a community of faith to participate in some kind of spectator sport. This is a worship service. We've not come to worship Kate and John. We've come to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, who created marriage, who created family, and gave us the gift of both. But in the context of worship in Christ, we have come with great thanksgiving to give God thanks for John and Kate and their vows of Christian marriage. So because this is participatory, and we haven't come to just see how pretty Kate is, though she is, it's a beautiful dress, by the way. And we haven't come to hear whether or not the folks have caught whatever they were shooting for in the distance when they were target practicing over there. Yep. Nor have we come to see if John were to kneel down for communion if he had help me written on the bottom of his shoes, which he doesn't, but he does have Western Carolina socks. So okay. I've already yeah, cool. seen those. But this is participatory, so I'm going to ask you a question, and if you can affirm it, I would like for you to answer in the affirmative saying, we will. Well, all of you gathered here today, by God's grace, do everything in your power to uphold and care for John and Kate and their vows of Christian marriage. And your answer? Amen. Who gives Kate to be married to John? Her mother and I. I made a reference a few moments ago what marriage is all about. There are some significant passages in Scripture. It's been said that marriage is in trouble today. It's been said that it's an institution that perhaps is on its way out. That's a huge paradox. Because if you ask the average person today under the age of 80, if they're single, they're not really against marriage. If you ask the average person under 40 and they're single, they've thought about it or would like to get married. If you ask the average person under the age of 30, marriage is not what is unappetizing. What's challenging, though, is how do you marry the right person? How do you marry the right person? I'm going to begin today by giving you some good news. Okay. And uh, then I'll give you the bad news. <laughs> the good news is that you married the wrong person. Good. Excellent. That's the good news. Yeah. <laughs> the bad news is um, that you can continue to marry the wrong person or 
things can dramatically and beautifully change. You see, the reason why we marry the wrong person is because we fall in love with a person, and yet you can't expect that person to remain the same. The other thing is you're falling in love with a person that you know something about, but it's hard for all of us to know everything about them. And so when we fall in love, we fall in love based upon what we know about the person. That's why I think scripture is so powerful because it helps us understand how we can go the distance. In Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, he loved the church at Ephesus. He was its pastor for three years, more than any other church in the New Testament. He was only at Corinth for 18 months. Paul says this in verse 21, and further you will submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now we ought to just <clears throat> camp out on that because that means we're supposed to respect and honor one another. When's the last time on a scale of one to 10, you've looked at somebody in your family and you just put a 10 on their forehead. You said, she's valuable, he's valuable. When's the last time you've done some to that to somebody at your workplace or your school or your neighborhood? Instead of seeing them as a two or a three or as a loser, you automatically put a 10 on their forehead. That's what Paul's talking about. He goes on to say, Wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord, for a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the body in the church. And he gave, he gave his life to be her Savior. And as the church submits to Christ, so wives should submit to their husbands in, other, in, other, in everything. And husbands, love your wives with the same love Christ showed the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean and washed by baptism and God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or a wrinkle or any blemish. Instead, she'll be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man's actually loving himself when he loves his wife. No one hates his own body but he lovingly cares for it, just as Christ cares for his body, which is the church. And we, we are his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Isaiah 40 and 1 Peter says the grass will one day wither. The flowers, one day they're going to fade away. But this word of the living God, it will stand forever. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And so Paul gives us the secret. He says this is a mystery in some translations, but if you read the Koine Greek, and I had the pleasure of translating this passage when I was at Greensburg College, and the, from Koine Greek into English, and one of the things that we couldn't get over is we we're finding it hard to find an equivalent word for mystery or secret. And it wasn't like there's some distant thing that God has yet to reveal to us, but in this word, it's like God's trying to say, here's the key to marriage. And what's the key to marriage? Well, he, he gives it to us if we'll just look at it. The key to marriage is the essence of the gospel. If you want a marriage that goes a distance, Think about the gospel. First of all, what do we celebrate? Incarnation. Christmas. The most beautiful and powerful thing about Christmas that we cannot deny is that God humbled himself. Philippians 2, 5 says, Have this mind among yourselves which you have in Christ Jesus, that he, though being found in the form of God, did not count equality with God to be held on to, but he emptied himself taking the form of a human being. So the first act of the gospel was that God humbled himself. He didn't have to come to earth. But he came because he loves you. He came because he loves me. He loves every person that's here in the sound of my voice. You see, the gospel has an object. You, you're the object of his love. But it begins with humility. Because he was all-powerful. 
He had a good gig going on in heaven. He didn't have to leave the place. Angels worshiping you all the time, bringing you coffee and tea and barbecue and things like that. Yeah. You're going to leave that and come here with all this people shooting guns and crap off? I mean, I wouldn't leave heaven. Yeah. I'd... So he humbled himself. So in marriage, it will endure if we humble ourselves. And then secondly, he gave of himself. I don't know of any marriage that will be enriched, any marriage that will be beautiful. There's a bunch of junk theology floating around today. If I could just find my soulmate. Oh, if I could just find my soulmate. Be happy. Be so happy. It'd be beautiful if I could find my soulmate. Find your soulmate, John, you'd be happy. You don't find your soulmate. You become each other's soulmate through humility and through giving of yourself. That's why he says that three times he says to the guys, he said, listen, you're to present your wife like Christ is presenting the church. He gave himself for her. He sacrificed for her. He loved her. Marriage will not endure unless we humble ourselves and give of ourselves to one another as a servant leader. In a few moments, you're going to demonstrate some of that. And I hope it'll be a beautiful motif for the rest of your marriage because we got to give. And the third thing is no secret, but there's no way. There's no way to have an enduring marriage unless we forgive. Unless we forgive. You're going to hurt each other as best as you will try. You're still going to say something stupid every now and then. You just will. You're going to, you're, you're going to, he's going to work real hard to do something out in the garage, and you're going to look at that and say, couldn't we just hire somebody else to do that next time? And you're not going to know how that's going to hurt a male ego, but, but and you're just going to be honest. You're not trying, you know, you're not trying to say you did a bad job. You're just going to be honest. You just, you know. And so we're going to hurt each other. It doesn't matter. We're going to hurt each other. But we have to choose to forgive. We have to choose to let go of bitterness. We have to choose to let go of a vengeful thought. We have to choose to give that to God because if we hold on to it, we only poison ourselves in our own hearts and our own lives. So to forgive is to be like Christ. I believe we're like God when we do two things, when we give and when we forgive. You go the distance when you do those two things. When I think of those two things, I think of Dr. Robertson McWelkin. For 39 years, he was in education, Christian education. He was the president of Columbia University. As I remember history, he had been there for about 10 years. Enrollment had more than doubled. Endowments had gone up triple. All the trustees like it when endowments triple. There's money for scholarships. There's money to improve the university. Great things are happening when Dr. McQuilkin was there. He noticed that when he would come home, his wife began to forget things. Then one morning when he went out, the head of security for campus called him and said, we found your wife halfway across town. Her feet were bleeding. She'd been walking for hours and hours and hours, yelling out your name. The doctor said she's in the latter stages of Alzheimer's. And the trustees met, had an emergency meeting. They said, Dr. McQuilkin, there's a wonderful home nearby you can put her in. We'll help you with the finances for that. And uh, you can go by and see her three times a day. You can care for her. Because, after all, she's your wife. And so we'll try to lighten your load as president of Columbia. He thought about it, told him he'd give his answer the next day, and when he came back, he gave him his letter of resignation. The board was shocked. One of the gentlemen, he didn't mean to be harmful again. We just say stupid things without thinking. He just blurted out, but Robert, Robert, she, she doesn't even know your name now. She, she forgets who you are. He said, you're right. There are times when I go see Ms. McQuilkin, she doesn't remember who I am. I have to admit that. But you see, 39 years ago, I stood before God and a group of people, and I remember who she is. 
And I remember saying, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, and forsaking all others. I'll be faithful as long as we both shall live. I remember. So may God bless you to give and forgive and to honor one another because you are gifts to one another. There's good news, bad news, and then there's good news. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to bless this act of worship and pour out your grace and mercy upon John and Kate in tremendous ways, in ways that they may not even sometimes understand. But it's your mercy. It's your grace going before them, guiding and directing them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, John, if you will take your lovely bride's hand, and we're going to share in the exchange of vows, and if you'll repeat after me. I, John. I, John. In the name of Christ. In the name of Christ. Take you, Kate. Take you, Kate. To be my wife. To be my wife. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poor. For richer, for poor. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Until we are parted by death. Until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. This is my solemn vow. Okay, if you'll repeat after me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, Kate. I, Kate. In the name of Christ. In the name of Christ. Take you, John. Take you, John. To be my husband. To be my husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poor. For richer, for poor. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Until we are parted by death. Until we are parted by death. This is my solemn vow. This is my solemn vow. Amen. May I have the rings? That guy. <laughs> they trusted me. Trust the ring. <laughs> right. I give them to you. <laughs> You'll put that on the third finger from the index. And repeat after me. Mm -hmm. I, John. I, John. Give you this ring. Give you this ring. As a sign of my vow. As a sign of my vow. With all that I am. With all that I am. And all that I have. And all that I have. I honor you. I honor you. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Holy Spirit. Okay, if you'll do the same, third finger. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I, Kate, I, Kate. Give you this ring. Give you this ring. As a sign of my vow. As a sign of my vow. And with all that I am. With all that I am. And all that I have. And all that I have. I honor you. I honor you. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. The Son. In the name of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Holy Spirit. Bless the Lord the giving of these rings, that as John and Kate wear them, they may live in your peace and continue in your favor all the days of their life through the power of Jesus Christ and through the love of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. 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 John and Kate are desirous of wanting to serve one another. Lots of ways they could do that today. Really are. I mean, there are lots of ways. One of the things that Jesus gives us in the New Testament is often not reserved. I think there only may be one denomination that calls it a sacrament. And that's okay, I'm not here today trying to make this a sacrament per se. But Jesus did say to them when he finished demonstrating what sacrificial love is, Jesus said, I command you to do this to one another. It's interesting, think about it for a moment. He never commanded us to take the bread. He never commanded us to take the cup. But once he washed the feet of the disciples, he said, I command you, I say to you, do this one to another. You know what's weird about that? A few moments earlier, they were jockeying to see which one was going to set at his right, which was going to set at his left. And Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you wash feet. You serve one another. Simon Jesus said, Lord, you will not wash my feet. Jesus said, Simon. 
John Peter, if you do not let me wash your feet, you will have no part in me. Simon Peter said to the Lord, then not just my feet, Lord, but my hands and my head. Wash all of me, Lord. Wash all of me. If you have felt moved to carry out Jesus' desire to be a servant, perhaps as a married couple, if you're with your spouse today or as a family, the towel and wash basin will be here. You're welcome to come and participate in this act of worship if you are so led. Well, John and Kate, now that you have <laughs> declared your consent and vows before God in this congregation, now as you have given yourselves with these solemn vows, with the joining of hands and the giving of rings, I announce to you that you are indeed husband and wife. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, that which and those whom God has joined together, let no person put asunder. You may bless your bride with a kiss. Thank you for speech and everything. And I pray that everything they do will 
before class got, which I don't know. But uh, thank you all for being good friends, for always being there, and for being there through all the tough times and the good times. Because there's many a times where myself and John have done all kinds of stuff that would be with me and John. But uh, we've been in places from going in our boxers on the middle of campus in the middle of a pond together, all the way to shooting tater guns <laughs> in the middle of uh, the parking lots of different apartments and getting, getting kicked out. <laughs> I know I'm supposed to keep this short and sweet now, but one quick story. <laughs> oh my god. So, Kim is a mountain. And if you know any of us, you know that we all love to be active and hiking and stuff like that. So, you think somebody proposes a hike and it's this great thing, and Pinnacle. If any of the two of them ever ask you to go on a hike in Pinnacle, deliberately tell them no, smack them, and walk away. It is the worst hike in the world. But, uh, even Stephen with his substance shoes. His substance shoes. But anyways, back, back to the point of it, because I'm keeping you from all the fun of being hanging out, dancing, and everything else, and Paul. So, also congratulations to Paul being here. That's an awesome yeah. piece. So, I will wrap it up, because I can talk for days, and if you don't need that, that's true. Um, I, I would like to give y'all a little something. And this isn't your your gift, but it is a gift because I know how important memories and all that stuff are. So, I don't know if you caught it, but at your engagement, at that time I was in law enforcement, so what I did was probably not the best of things. But, I acquired something from their engagement. And if you saw photos and things like that, they got an engagement right in front of the cross. And the cross has lights and everything so, pictures are also in the say, a million words, million of how you're going to look at it. But, I would love to leave you with something from that day that hopefully shines forever and, and continues in your house. So, here's a light from the cross. So, one, two, and three. Happy birthday! 